Britt, and I'm the community manager here at Trusted. And for those of you all who don't know, Trusted is a travel nurse company that places nurses in all 50 states. But amongst those, we also have blog, career resources, and events like these um, just to help you throughout your journey, whether it's starting nursing or starting travel nursing, or even just doing things out in the wild like we're here for today. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping um, for the actual platform so you guys can um, understand a little bit more about it. There is a general section where people are already writing hellos and things like that. So that's where you'll guide, you all will connect and get to know, you know people on the webinar with us, as well as there's a Q&A section if you'll toggle to that. And there will be a couple of points in uh, Jennifer's presentation where we'll actually um, go through questions. So if you'll just jot those down there, that'll be a great place to put those. And if you see someone that has already asked a question that you really like and you want answered, you can also upvote it to make sure that I get that one, get to that one um, quickly. As well as if you need anything um, during the presentation, you can DM me, um, whether if you're having um, audio and visual issues or anything like that, I can try to help you walk through those. I also wrote at the beginning of the chat, I pinned a message um, for everyone at the top here. Um, and it just uh, lets everyone know that we are going to record this. So for people who are on shift, off shift, or just couldn't make it today, we will be sending out the slides as well as the recording um, a couple of days after the event. So be looking out for that if you missed it or you know you took some notes and you just want to remember something. Um, as well as if you are, are having um, audio and visual issues, what you can do is you can go out of the event, you can test your audio and visual in the beginning, as well as use Google Chrome. If neither of those things work for you and you're having trouble with either of those things, there's a help question mark at the top and there's always Bevy um, support people here to help as well as, like I said before, you can DM me. I'm, I'm, I'll be here through the, the whole presentation. So I got you guys. Um, so those are like the housekeeping things, the non-fun things, um, but uh, we'll kind of get started here now um, after I went all the boring stuff. Um, we just want to thank uh, Wilderness Medical Society so much for partnering with us on these great events, um, and we're super excited. Um, I do have a video to show you guys because, oh my gosh, they are just uh, a wealth of knowledge. So I'm going to um, present now so you guys can see this video. Let me, sorry. Here we go. We believe the wild keeps us alive. We stand for kindness, service, inclusivity, education, and nature. We elevate others as we climb. We see the need and fill the gap. We look to uproot barriers, not trees. We seek knowledge and pay it forward. We find our way in the wild. We are the Wilderness Medical Society, a community of medical professionals devoted to facilitating high quality care in the outdoors. Our global membership and world-renowned experts affirm our collective authority to set clinical standards and disseminate the most comprehensive array of wilderness medicine knowledge. Our innovative programs, publications, research, and certifications equip you with the tools to practice in any environment, on or off the planet. Healthy lives are nurtured in wild places. Join us on the adventure and truly come alive. Wow. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I was already excited about this. Oh, wow. This just wants to go crazy on me, huh? Technical difficulties, guys. This is real people, real world things. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, I mean, I was already excited about this presentation, but if, if anything, that video just made me even more excited. Um, so without further ado, we do have Dr. Jennifer Dow with us today um, that's going to present on hypothermia. So you guys get ready for a super chill presentation. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good wherever you are. And Britt, I'm going to have you tell me if you're seeing the appropriate slide, the opening slide. I am. It looks good. Fantastic. All right. 
So we are going to talk about hypothermia. So first, a little bit about myself. I am a physician up in Anchorage. I've been up here for about 25 years. I serve as the medical director for the National Park Service, Alaska region, U.S. Forest Service, Alaska region, Guardian Flight Alaska, Alaska Pipeline Company, and the Alaska Mountain Patrol. All of these are outside. I do practice in a brick and mortar environment, but that's not my preferred place to be. So wilderness and austere medicine is my, my happy place. I am also the secretary for the board of directors for the Wilderness Medical Society. I don't have any disclaimers to give you. Um, you're gonna see pictures of my dogs and uh, they love being silly. The white one is Scotty. She is a Marama sheepdog. And the uh, sled dog is 14 years old. She is named Tefra. Um, she's retired from Denali National Park. So I have some ground rules. First, there's no stupid questions. I may defer a question if I'm covering the topic later. I'm not perfect, I make mistakes. Speak up if something doesn't make sense. And I don't like it if somebody uses the words, I'm only a, I'm just a, they're not allowed. We all have expertise in our fields and I honor your expertise. And yes, this is a soapbox moment for me. Clearly it's something that, that I feel strongly about. And just so that you are aware, I am unable to see the chat box and the questions while I'm presenting. So Britt will be, putting forth those questions when we come to some breaks in the presentation. So our pathway, and some can call this objectives, and we'll start developing an understanding of what hypothermia is and what it's not. We'll discuss the pathophysiology of it, hypothermia risk factors, and those things that are gonna make your patient more susceptible. And then finally, we're gonna discuss prevention, recognition, and treatment, which really is a cycle. Well, if we do stage hypothermia, we give it, give it grades of severity, it is a continuum. And if we can keep the patient from progressing in the wrong direction, then we are able to treat them quicker, they can respond faster, and in the cases of being outside, you may not have to actually rescue them, but they can self-evacuate. So I know that there were some questions in the RSVP, which we will go over, but think about these. Do, does it have to be freezing for you to become hypothermic? You can die in hypothermia in minutes. Age doesn't matter. I'm from Alaska or Minnesota, Norway, Utah. I'm used to the cold. I won't get hypothermia. Cotton is the best fiber to wear in the cold. And you lose all your heat through your head. Think about those as we go forward. So have you ever been in any of these situations? Strand or out hiking with your family? Or were you the designated provider for a group? Camping, scout camp, ad hoc outing where someone said, oh, you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a paramedic, you can take care of us if we get hurt. Have you ever been immersed in cold water? Or was it just a day outside? But ask yourself, thinking in your history, was hypothermia ever on your radar? And were you prepared for it if you needed to rewarm someone? So think about this, you're out hiking with a group and one person stumbles and falls. There's no apparent trip hazard. There's no particular reason why they might've fallen. They don't have any apparent injury. And so what might this be? So look at this picture and know my dog is just fine. She just doesn't wanna go back into the RV. So what do we see? We see somebody lying down. They don't appear to be very motivated but neither are they screaming in pain. What's the weather? It's overcast, it's dreary. Is it cold? There's no snow on the ground. In our brick and mortar environment, we often forget about the E of A, B, C, D, E. So we have airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and in trauma, E is exposed, but it's also environment and evacuate. So what is our environment and what are we going to need to evacuate our patient? So some not so fun facts. There's an average of 1,300 deaths per year that are associated with hypothermia. Now these are recorded as excessive exposure, or excuse, excuse me, exp exposure to excessive natural cold. So not associated with somebody getting locked in a freezer or somebody um, in a uh, therapeutic hypothermia situation. 67% are male. These are due to environmental exposure. 
And they're more common in what are called non-core areas, which means the non-urban environment. Now, they're not isolated to Arctic climates. It's absolutely not a, a phenomena of the extreme north or extreme south if you're in the southern hemisphere. And it's very likely that this is very, very underreported because we may not know if a patient had hypothermia or that was the cause of death if they were come upon later. And this doesn't touch the incidence because we don't know how many people have survived. And many people with mild or moderate hypothermia don't report it. So before we dive into hypothermia itself, let's talk about how we as a species maintain or attempt to do so our body temperature. Our species developed in equatorial regions. And as such, we didn't develop stellar physiologic capacity to combat the cold. We are an intelligent race for the most part, and we've learned adaptive strategies to deal with the cold, but we still sustain significant morbidity and even mortality from cold injury and illness. So in considering hypothermia, we do need to understand how we regulate our body's temperature, regardless of the ambient temperature. When all goes well, we're able to balance the forces of cold with our ability to generate heat. So let's talk about heat transfer. Now we're focusing on transfer of heat away from the body to the environment. Now heat transfer can be used to make somebody warmer or for somebody to lose heat. Hypothermia is the condition whereby the body's ability to generate heat or thermogenesis is overcome by cold. And it's not limited to sub-freezing temperatures. Most cases actually occur well above freezing. So the majority of our heat loss is through radiation. The heat goes from where it is to where it's not. We lose heat whenever we're in an environment that's colder than the body temperature. We do not lose most of our heat through our heads. That's just often what's most exposed. We don't always wear a hat. So if I'm to do thermal imaging of somebody who's standing out in the cold, wearing appropriate clothing, but not a hat, it's gonna look like they're losing all their heat through their head. We lose our heat the same through all of our skin surfaces. Putting on a hat though, just covers up that last bit of it. So conduction. Now she's conducting, she meaning my dog, is conducting snow, conducting heat through her paws into the deck and through her legs into the snow. And think of sitting on a cold rock, your bum gets cold, you're conducting heat away. Now in water, we lose up to 25 more times heat. So it, water is an amazing conductor, which is not good for us if we are trying to maintain heat. It's fantastic if you're sitting in a hot tub. Convection, either by air or water, is a very important heat loss mechanism when we're dealing with hot environments and not as much associated with cold environments, with the exception of when we have wind. So if you have wind, it's gonna pull the heat away from you. So the heat that's kind of sitting along the surface of your skin, if you can imagine it, the, the heat mirage, you're gonna have, the airflow is gonna pull it away. Now we use this a lot in rewarming. We use this with the bear hugger blankets. You can think about that. Now evaporation is when we lose heat through sweat. Again, it's not a really important mechanism when we're dealing with heat loss in cold environments. And respir respiration is a small but obligate con contribution to our heat loss. So let's move back on. So we're hiking. Now, how is Scotty losing heat? So she's not wearing a coat or an extra one. So she's radiating heat away. She's conducting heat to the ground. And if it's windy, some of the heat's gonna be convected away from her. So cold acclimatization. This is something that we have both behaviorally and physiologic. Now, there are impaired behavioral responses, which can be due from impair, impair, impaired cognition, I apologize that I'm stuttering, dementia, intoxicants, or other encephalopathies such as altitude, or inadequate shelter availability. We may be immobile. We can't move to shelter if you're too young, such as neonates who can't travel yet, or if you're injured, or you don't have access to food or drink. Then there's physiologic acclimatization. Cold-induced vasoconstriction decreases heat loss via radiation and convection because we are not having as much of the warm blood go to our extremities. We also decrease our metabolic demands, thereby we're not using as much energy. So exposure tolerance is also something that 
has been studied and does improve over time. Now, it's been recognized for centuries that exposure to extreme cold may lead to death. And accidental hypothermia due to extreme conditions is well described in the clinical literature in the mid 20th century. Now, clinical research investigating cold tolerance and rewarming really didn't begin until the 1940s with the development of cardiac and vascular surgery. However, there was some incredibly unethical research that was conducted in Nazi Germany where researchers were subjective, sub, excuse me, where researchers subjected concentration camp inmates to extreme temperatures to measure what their exposure tolerance was with reported resuscitation from a, a core temperature of 25 C. Unknown about what the neurologic status was of this unfortunate research subject. This has been followed by many more ethical studies performed in the US and the UK. Now extremes of field recovery are often what guide our resuscitation efforts. The mantra of you're not dead until you're warm and dread does have some validity. Dr. Anna Bagenholm was resuscitated with neurologic recovery from a recorded te core temperature of 13.6 C. And there are many, many cases of young children who are resuscitated from extreme cold. However, it is something that occurs in less extreme environments and it's not always recognized as such. One seminal event occurred in 1964, which was the Four Inns Walk, which occurred in the UK. And I believe it was a scout group. Ambient temperatures were 7C and three hikers died and four were rescued in critical condition and it was all associated with hypothermia. The upshot of this is that we can resuscitate people from profoundly deep hypothermia, but hypothermia doesn't have to occur in a freezing environment. It can occur in a non-freezing environment and in fact is more likely to occur if it's above freezing because people are not prepared for the cold. So let's move on to the definition again. So it's the accidental and uncontrolled drop of core temperature to 35 C or below. And I've given here some centigrade to Fahrenheit conversions for the temperatures that I tend to use. So 35 is 95, 32, roughly 90, 28, 82, and 24, 77. More definitions, primary hypothermia is associated when excessive cold overcomes our ability of thermogenesis. Secondary hypothermia is predominantly a medical condition where thermogenesis is disrupted. And yes, my dog, for some reason, likes to play in freezing cold water. Those are icebergs around her. So what are the predispositions or risk factors for hypothermia? We've talked about how we can get it. So increased heat loss, decreased heat production, or something that disturbs thermoregulation, whether it's medications, illness, or chronic conditions. Our first, increased heat loss. So unacclimatized individuals, they arrive from a warm climate. They're not responding well or appropriately to the decreased temperature. Skin disorders. So is there something that's causing an increased blood flow to the periphery? Or is something like psoriasis or another plaque disorder disrupting the body's ability to sense that there's cold. All of us have been told that our burn patients are exceptionally susceptible to hypothermia, and this is because they don't have that feedback. And then ethanol or other vasodilators, they're cutaneous vasodilators, and it also impairs temperature regulation from a hypothalamic aspect, and then it does impact the brain directly, not just the vasodilation. So decreased heat production in the elderly, they have impaired thermal perception, perception, excuse me, fewer reserves. Are they nourished properly? Is there enough fatty reserve, enough glycogen reserves in order for them to pull from? Now, neonates as well, there's a large surface area to mass ratio, and they're relatively deficient in subcutaneous tissue, and they don't have an efficient, it's, they do not have an efficient shivering mechanism. Now, this does show then that ages age does make a difference. So the very old and the very young are more susceptible. Now, hypoglycemia, malnutrition, either caused by underlying problems or from overexertion can also contribute to this. And then endocrine disorders lead to decreased heat production. 
Now, when we have disturbed thermoregulation, this can be from neuropathies, whether they're peripheral or central. We can have the encephalopathic impact on the hypothalamus where it just doesn't read what the temperature is. And again, alcohol, sedatives, phenothiazines, opioids, and neuromuscular blocking agents. Now, if you are out with a group, you don't know what kind of medications people are taking. Perhaps they are taking something that is going to disrupt their ability to respond to the cold. So what happened to Scotty? Did she get into the schnapps? Has she eaten today? Does she have the right clothes on? So we're touching on, is it something that disrupted her ability to actually see what her risks are in the environment so that schnapps could actually not only serve as an increased risk because of vasodilation, but also decrease of awareness. It disrupts our behavioral adaptation. Has she eaten or does she have the right clothes on? So Britt, do we have any questions so far that we need to address? If you guys want to just hop in the Q&A portion, um, Jennifer will be happy to answer any questions you have. I'll give it another minute or so. We don't have any yet. That's fine. I think this, is, this is very introductory right now. So. <laughs> I think you're just doing so good. That everyone's just like, yes, more and more. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we're good. All right. So let's talk about the effects of cold on different organ systems. So any underlying stressors, whether it's malnutrition or environmental um, disorders, whether it's an endocrine disorder, um, age, exhaustion, any of that is also going to make the negative response worse. So with your central nervous system, discoordination, confusion, lethargy, your pulmonary, while aspiration is a late finding, it is something that's associated with muscular failure or CNS failure. It is an increased risk. Renal, cold diuresis causes volume loss, can cause problems with ultimately with your cardiac output. And cardiac issues. So initially the heart's going to respond with an increased cardiac output, trying to move our metabolic demand and, and get what we need to the system to our to our periphery. But ultimately you're going to have bradycardia and then slow atrial fibrillation and it'll progress to ventricular dysrhythmias. And that's both because the heart is cold and because of a developing acidosis. And you can have myocardial irritability such that our heart is not going to respond to ACLS medications. Now, I recognize that we're talking about how we're going to deal with hypothermia in the field, not necessarily our brick and mortar environment, but that is something to be aware of. So what, what might this skier be experiencing? Well, this skier is probably not hypothermic. She's wearing appropriate clothing. This is a solstice ski that was uh, last year, but what about that cold diuresis? How many of you have gotten ready to go? You're all bundled up. You get outside, you've been outside for a couple minutes, and now you've got to go to the bathroom. That's not because you were unprepared. Cold diuresis is a real thing. Our kidneys really respond quickly. And so you may have to run into the woods to take care of that urge. So signs and symptoms. Initially, we have shivering, discoordination, confusion, and then the pulse and respiratory rate are going to be elevated. It's really important that you recognize these early signs, both in yourself or in your teammates. And this can make it so it never gets any worse. That can then progress to stupor, slowing pulse and respirations, coma, and then appearing dead. What's your differential on this? Pretty much anything that's gonna impact your ability to, to, to think, any altered mental status. So intoxication, carbon monoxide poisoning, altitude illness if the environment's appropriate, is it a stroke, heat illness, infection, metabolic derangement? And I know that we're talking about hypothermia, but the reason why I stick heat illness in here is in my work on Denali, I have been exposed to people and including myself while going up the, the uh, glacier actually suffered from heat exhaustion. The ambient temperature was below freezing, but I was overdressed and in direct sunlight and exerting myself heavily. And so I actually, did experience some heat illness. So it does need to stay on our differential. So going to stages. So recognition and treatment should not only be sequential, they should be simultaneous. 
If you recognize that an individual is hypothermic or beginning to, to show signs, you treat immediately. And this minimizes the risk of this advancing. So there's tremendous variation amongst people. There's multiple scales for hypothermia presented by different countries, different agencies. And we're gonna talk about just the field treatment and the field presentation. This is not based upon core temperature, but I am going to give you information about core temperature. So our treatment should be guided by clinical presentation and not necessarily by numbers. So this is used with permission and there's the, the link down there for the cold card. And this is um, presented through the Wilderness Medical Society and through Canada. And this is, gives us a really nice review of the different stages of hypothermia. I'm not gonna leave this on the screen because we're gonna go through each of these individually. So cold stress, this is when you're shivering, but you're completely functional. Your brain's working and all you need is exercise and calories. Exercise to warm you up, calories to make sure that you have enough fuel to keep shivering if you need to. I'm pretty sure all of us have been there. And this can happen in the water, it can happen swimming. We see this probably more so with children that are in the, in the ocean that just don't wanna come out, but they're shivering and their lips are blue. They probably have cold stress and might not yet be hypothermic at this time. So then progressing to mild hypothermia. In this case, your patient is still alert. So they have normal or their vital signs may be a bit increased. This is what we call the responsive phase. Their cardiac output is elevated, manifesting by their pulse and blood pressure being up. This is when you'll start to have that cold diuresis. And this is not just your, immediate, your first time walking outside and having to go to the bathroom after being out for five minutes. This is a much more profound. Shivering is occurring, and this is heat generation. But you might note when they're moving that they might have a little bit of ataxia or dysarthria. They're having difficulty, for example, um, zipping up their jacket. So fine motor control is, is failing, or their speech is just a little bit slurred, or they're not remembering the slope that you just hiked up. And this is the approximate core temperature of 32 to 35. Treatment for this, first and foremost, and with everything, is prevent further heat loss. Take off any wet clothing and, and replace it with dry clothing. Get something warm around the patient. Insulate them better. If they're protecting their airway, which with mild hypothermia they should be, calorie replacement. Now, if you're given the option of giving somebody hot water, hot sugar-free hot chocolate, or a room temperature diet Coke, excuse me, a room temperature regular Coke, go with the room temperature regular Coke. It has sugar. The other two are great if they're hot, but you also need to replace calories. Now, mild exercise can also be um, initiated. Now, the reason why there's this notation of after 30 minutes is that you wanna make sure that patient is still able to generate heat with whether it's calories or increased insulation. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes. You don't want them to sit there for 30 minutes and get colder. It's just a consideration if they might be right on the edge. Now that exercise though has to be monitored. They can't do it alone. Maybe it's just stepping in place or doing windmills with their arms or make it useful, shovel snow. But mild hypothermia can be treated in the field. Oftentimes these patients don't have to be evacuated. They just have to be watched closely and to make sure that they have the caloric replacement to help prevent this from happening again. In addition, to preventing further heat loss with insulation. Now, if we move forward to moderate hypothermia, this is the slowing stage. Now, shivering may still be present below 30 degrees centigrade. There used to be this thought that there was this hard cutoff, but that's not necessarily the case. Patients will have poor focus because their pupils are dilating. And this is when we have the, the phenomena of paradoxic undressing or the hunter's reflex or hunter's response. These patients might be stuporous. The cold diuresis continues. And so that's when you start to get uh, incontinence because they're not aware of the fact that they need to urinate. And then you can see the core temperatures tend to be between 28 and 32 C. Now, if you happen to be in the healthcare set, uh, setting or if you happen to have a monitor, you might see atrial fibrillation. You might see a profound bradycardia. Osborne waves may be present. And if you have the capacity to do labs, there might be metabolic acidosis. So the treatment, again, the general guidelines, and that starts with not letting the patient lose any more heat. So a hypothermia wrap is something that's very important, and that's when you put a vapor barrier, you insulate the patient, and you 
prevent them from losing as much heat. So when we initiate active external rewarming, we keep the patient horizontal, and this is the very fragile point. We can actually kick somebody in from a stable rhythm into an unstable cardiac rhythm, cardiac rhythm in this, at this stage of hypothermia. Now, in the field, we'll often use hot water bottles for active external rewarming. And your regulatory systems go a little bit haywire here, and that's where you might have that paradoxic vasodilation. So they, this causes an increased flow of blood out to the periphery, and then you lose heat in the core and the brain. And this is oftentimes when patients will kick over from moderate to severe. Now, one of the things that we talk about is, oh, do we give the patient, do we do body-to-body -body contact? Well, in reality, that really just makes two people cold. Not to say that you can't do it, because if someone is moderate, is, is mild or very early moderate hypothermia, you may be generating enough heat to ha help with the active external rewarming. But you are also at great risk for getting cold yourself. So this is where we have in here what the hypothermia wrap is or the burrito. And if the clothing is very wet, you really want to remove it if possible and get them into dry clothing. We're going to try to put some heat source, whether it's a hot water bottle or something of that nature, along the chest or in the axilla. We're going to wrap somebody up in a, a vapor barrier. And so it's going to be a, a plastic sheet, and that's what we're going to use. And that's going to help prevent loss or help prevent um, a loss from, excuse me, prevent loss from evaporation. We're going to then insulate the patient and then wrap them up again in another vapor barrier. Now, if you're thinking, how am I going to carry all of this with me? We'll talk about that later on. You don't have to carry a lot. So then let's touch on paradoxic undressing. And this is something that happens in moderate to severe hypothermia. Vascular dilation occurs, and that's because there's this disconnect between what the body senses to be the temperature and the brain's response. The brain thinks, oh, it's warm. And so they dilate their, the, um, the periphery. We're gonna lose a ton more cold or more heat that way. The patient's gonna get significantly colder but they have this paradoxic sensation of warmth. Because they're already disoriented, they remove their clothing. And this is something that we see in 25 to 50% of patients. Now, I realize that that's a really broad range, but what this does point out is it happens quite a lot. So if you see somebody stripping down while you're on a hike or out during an event, be concerned. They, they may truly just be overheated, but this may also be that they're going from moderate to severe hypothermia. So severe hypothermia is really marked by a decrease in level of consciousness. And your AVP use scale or your alert, verbal, pain, unresponsive, they're a P or a U. You can actually start having some pulmonary edema, which is a non-cardiogenic type. The gag reflex is, is suppressed. They're not shivering anymore. Their temperature is generally less than 28. And if they're not in a, a profound sinus bradycardia, they may actually be in V-fib or asystole. Now, this is something that occurs when a patient is, um, excuse me, when this does occur and we give ACLS drugs, these drugs are oftentimes not effective until the body temperature is over 30. So our resuscitation here, again, preventing further heat loss. We want to initiate rewarming, and this is what we're balancing resuscitation and rewarming. We want to do this simultaneously, but you've got to prevent further, further heat loss. So we don't strip the patient down to evaluate them. You might un-, un zip their jacket to just listen to them, but you don't strip them down. Once a patient gets to the emergency department, we tend to strip them down completely. But what's the temperature in the room? It's probably 70. In many trauma centers, they're now jacking the heat up in the trauma bays into the 90s, and that's to protect the patients. It's horrible for the providers, but it protects the patients. So we may initiate fluid resuscitation if we have that available to us or not. So are they deceased? not dead until warm and dead. So one thing that's really important is don't do any compressions if you feel any pulse. And that means even a heart rate of like six. This is because there's significant metabolic slowing and it's probably enough to keep the patient going at this metabolic rate or hibernation state that they're in right now. It's really hard to not do that. You may not feel the pulse and then you start compressions. We use the usual rate and depth as feasible, we continue to do it during transport. Now, you don't want to do human compressions while someone's moving. And what I mean by that is that you as a person will not be doing the compressions. You might have a mechanical device. 
Now, intermittent or delayed CPR in a severely hypothermic patient is better than nothing at all, and it may in fact be as effective as continuous. The jury's still out. Mechanical depression devi compression devices, such as the Lucas device, if you happen to be hauling that with you, are useful. And if you've gone 30 minutes with rewarming techniques and the core temperature is greater than 32, then oftentimes we'll stop. So when not to compress, big thing, rescue or exhaustion or danger, absolutely do not put yourself at risk. Obvious fatal injuries, if they're frozen. And in this case, a hard thorax, or if there's ice formation in the airway, that means somebody is frozen. Avalanche burial for greater than 60 minutes, any pulse, or any organized cardiac activity on a monitor. There's some other things that we put in here. If you have labs, lab capacity, potassium over 12, or pH less than 6.5. So let's go back to Scotty. So she's awake. She moves with minimal encouragement. And so we gave her some food. We put a jacket over on her and made her a little happier. We did some monitored exercise, and here she is. So what stage was she in? So she was mild, cold stress to mild. She didn't need much. She was able to get up and move around with just a little bit of encouragement. So more questions, Britt? All right, we do have, we do have a couple. Um, all right, so Lisa asks, how does Raynaud's play into risk for hypothermia, or is it more of a risk for frostbite? So Raynaud's is more of a risk for frostbite than hypothermia, unless the individual uh, with Raynaud's has other vascular problems such that there is um, disrupted vasoconstriction or vasodilation in the extremities. Perfect. And um, Kai asks, what are you using to check the temperature? In, my, in her experience or his experience um, is that most thermometers have really small batteries and run out of power earlier in the cold. So on a longer trip uh, where your kid is in the backpack, what do you use? So that's why we give the, the stages, why we try to stage people by clinical signs, because it can be very difficult to get a temperature in the field. The only temperatures that are really even close to accurate for a core temperature is an esophageal temperature. And I don't know of any of you that carry esophageal probes with you. Oral temperatures don't tend to be accurate. The ear or temporal temperatures are not accurate. Um, and if you choose to do a rectal temperature, it has to be done with care such that you're not taking off any insulation or clothing to make sure that you don't make things actually worse. And so when I've been in the field and I'm able to get to somebody to a, a safe, warm environment, I will sometimes take a rectal temperature very carefully, but you oftentimes have to have a, a, a thermometer that goes below the usual rating. Most thermometers will not go below 95. Um, so that is in the field, it's next to impossible to get a good temperature. All right, and um, Megan asks, um, I've never worked in adventure race as an RN in the snow or cold climate, just hot climate. Seems like a lot of potential concerns for racers in the cold terrain. Any prep tips for nurses working on these races aside from the cold card? So the cold card is very helpful. But one of the other things that I found when I, when I work with these racers is that they will do fine while they're running. Then they're at an aid station. They stop moving. They stop with the muscle movement and they get very cold very quickly. And so they'll drop into moderate, deep moderate, or excuse me, they'll drop into, into mild and then possibly even moderate because suddenly they're not generating heat from movement. The racers will tend to not wear enough clothing or they won't um, put clothing on when they're, when they're hot. So if they're at an aid station and they're pausing for a period of time, it's really important to get something over them, a wool blanket um, or some form of insulation so that they're not losing heat through evaporation. The heat loss is oftentimes through evaporation. In this case, uh, because they are sweating so much, they do tend to not wear enough clothing because of the concern of getting overheated. Additionally, they're generally not hydrating or getting enough um, calories to support thermogenesis if they're right on the edge. And so what I push is getting them warm, getting calories into them, and um, making sure that they're still able to move and are coordinated. If someone's stumbling or they're unable to do fine motions, that might be 
a, a reason to actually pull them from the race? That may or may not have answered the question. If um, you need further explanation, you can just write it. Um, oh, no, she said awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, that's really interesting though. I really, I found that informational. Um, wow. Uh, Kyla asks, can you explain more about moderate hypothermia, a person being fragile in terms of rewarming them? It seemed like they could flip into severe when rewarming is initiated. So when I talk about being fragile, I also talk about them being physically fragile. So we're going, what we like to do is keep them horizontal, um, just because when you have a disruption of your vasodilation or vasoconstriction, if we move a patient from horizontal to vertical, you have a significant fluid shift within the vascular system, and that can cause problems as far as suddenly not having enough for cardiac output. Additionally, because the heart is cold and acidosis has um, developed, any form of physical shock can kick somebody over from a mild to, or excuse me, from a moderate to severe, or just kick them over from a survivable rhythm to a non-survivable rhythm. When we start to rewarm someone, it's real important that we focus on rewarming the core. We don't want to just dump somebody in a hot tub, because um, if we take somebody who's cold, we'll, we'll say that they're supporting their own airway and everything else. We dump them in, in warm water. What's immediately going to happen is that they're going to vasodilate. And then that very cold blood from the periphery is now going to go to the core. And then that can further cool the heart and cause cardiac dysrhythmias. So these patients are fragile in that we have to make sure that we don't tip that balance further into, the, into hypothermia. Now, it's very possible that when we start reheating, somebody will get worse. And there are conditions called afterdrop, which I didn't go into in great depth with this presentation, which is caused by the cold blood going to the core and causing problems with the cardiac stability. I can give a more in-depth answer later on if you'd like, or I can give you a resource for that. If you uh, want either of those, you can just type it in there and then I'll, I'll, I'll send that her way. Um, those are the only questions we have. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Are um, I will... I will, the, the best resource right now is actually um, what I would suggest is the Wilderness Medical, Wilderness Medical Society guidelines for the field treatment of hypothermia it was updated in um, 2019. And that also goes over why the field guidelines were recommended, what the research was, the grade of recommendation, um, and why some things weren't chosen as well. And that, um, article is available if you are not a member of the Wilderness Medical Society, and you do not have to be a subscriber to the journal. It is one that's, that is readily available. All right, so I'm going to move on to prevention. And as suggested before, if we can prevent hypothermia from getting worse, we're not going to drop down into a more severe state, hopefully. But it would be much better if we could prevent it altogether. I think we all agree with that. So a big part of it is awareness. So weather, capacity of the participants, gear and equipment. And no, you really don't want to carry all of this gear on a day trip. Um, your own gear that you have. What's the group gear? What clothing choice? Um, yours and other people. Do you have emergency gear or, and is there an evacuation plan? And a big part of clothing choice is making sure that the right fibers are used. Wool and synthetic fibers um, are phenomenal for insulation and heat. Cotton is great in a hot environment, but cotton holds moisture. It does not insulate once it's wet, and it's lousy in the cold environments. So consider your weather. Accidental hypothermia, you know, doesn't have to be freezing. We've, we've already discussed that. But go to the, go to the internet. Go to weather.gov. Check what your local resources are. Look at your avalanche center if you happen to be in a mountainous area. Many resorts will have weather forecasts and they'll talk specifically about what the wind forecast is or whether or not there's fog expected or thunder. Those are easily available. And actually the, the NOAA site has graphs for anticipated or predicted temperature and wind um, over the course of hours. So it's very easy to figure out what it's going to be. So what's the capacity? So does each participant know what to expect? Do they have the appropriate clothing? And there is no room for ego. 
And all of us can be guilty of this. And we, we think, oh yeah, I can do this. This is not a problem. I, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep pushing. But they're afraid to stop or to tell people, you know, I'm a little cold. I need to put another layer on. Or my feet hurt. I need to check to make sure I'm not getting blisters. Or I'm getting really hungry. So there's no room for ego. It's really important that people recognize that stopping and taking care of yourself is key. So gear. So this is some of my personal gear. I took this picture this morning. I chucked all of this in the snowbank in the backyard. Um, so some of this I'll be wearing anyway. I probably will have my hat on, probably will have gloves on. And there's two jackets there. One is a, is a puffy and, and the other is a, a wind slash rain jacket. Now, I will either stuff these in and around my pack to fill space or both of these jackets actually fit into their their pockets. And so they take a little, very little bit of, of space and they compact down to a very small volume. Now, I also always have extra socks and they're a game changer if your feet get wet. You can also use them to put on your hands if you lost your gloves. There's all kinds of things you can use them for. I watched somebody once tie them together and use them and make them into a neck gaiter. You can use them. The key thing is use socks that fit with the shoes that you're using. I made the mistake once of putting in very puffy, full socks that I might wear as slippers. I got my socks very, very wet and my tennis shoes were soaked, but my tennis shoes did not fit with those big puffy socks. So make sure that they're the same type of socks that you would otherwise bring and not cotton. And then a water bottle, a Nalgene type. Now, I tend to carry the small ones, the, the 500 cc bottles, and I'll carry four of those instead of two two liter bottles. Now, the thermally insulated bottles are awesome, but they don't conduct heat. And so if you are using a hot water bottle for active external rewarming, you can't use one of the hydro flasks or a thermos or something of that nature because it's doing its job, but not the secondary job you want it to do. Now, you can also use a hydration bladder as far as heat conduction. You just have to be careful that you don't melt the bladder itself. Be careful for burns. We don't want to put things directly against skin because they can cause burns. And so that's something that you can do. Now, emergency gear, this is additional debris that I carry. I do have a small stove and it's something that's like a um, either a jet boil or MSR. I don't get any kickback from these companies, um, but something that's self-contained. And that black um, stuff sack there is actually a sleeping bag. It's a, a 40 degree sleeping bag that I keep stuffed in the bottom of my pack. And it is something that is has been very useful multiple times, even just to wrap around somebody's shoulders. It doesn't take up a lot of room. You might not need it on a real short hike, but it's something to think about. Now, garbage bags. Garbage bags have multiple uses. So I'll use them for the vapor barrier that we talked about in the, in the cold card. Or, um, but they're also good to you can make it into a rain poncho. You cut out the head and put some arms in it and you have a rain poncho in case you don't have rain gear with you. It can be a pack protector or you can put it inside your pack and then put everything inside the trash bag. And if your pack gets soaked, your gear doesn't. Now I always keep extra food and it's something that's high sugar and something I don't like. And I do that on purpose so I won't go after it if I just want a snack. I have to be really hungry before I'll go for it. Now first aid kit, communication device, all of these things also should be considered and it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. But think about what you have. Do things have multiple uses? Are you in cell coverage? If you're not, make sure you have some way of communicating if, if you're well away from the road system and won't be able to get a rescue. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on immersion. And this is the 1101 rule. So cold shock response, it lasts about one minute. And it refers to the impact of cold and what it has on your breathing. There's an automatic gas reflex in response to the rapid cooling of the skin. And if your head goes underwater, that gas response can actually lead to aspiration, which if you're lucky, you get up and cough everything out or it can lead to drowning. Now, following this gasp, there is a reactive hyperventilation. And that is also because of a reaction to the cold. Naturally, it will subside, but panic may cause it to continue. This can lead to someone fainting because of the hyperventilation and then subsequent aspiration and drowning. Now, these are the patients that the, the media will say they died instantly from hypothermia. No, they didn't. They drowned. Now, 
cold incapacitation is something that occurs within five to 15 minutes. And so we hit 10 for the middle of that. And that's because of the profound vasoconstriction of the cold water. It decreases blood flow to the extremities and it leads to very clumsy muscles. So you'll be unable to stay afloat and drown. And so you have 10 minutes, 10 minutes of useful muscle capacity in order to get safe. Now, hypothermia does not occur immediately. It, for most adults, it takes more than 30 minutes to become mildly hypothermic in ice water. Now you're gonna shiver, but all of these other things occur because we're vasoconstricting. We are able to protect ourselves. Now the rate of temperature drop is dependent upon the surface area exposed, the native insulation, so amount of, of, of extra padding that somebody may have, the amount of peripheral vasoconstriction, and some diseases will make this happen faster. And then circumrescue collapse is something that will occur right after somebody is rescued. So for example, somebody might have been able, they've been doing well, they've been treading water, they've been using a, a safety float, the rescuers get there, they get them out, they get them into the boat, and then suddenly they collapse. Or they drag themselves up onto shore, they seem to be fine, and then suddenly they collapse. The thought process behind this is that there is a sudden decrease in the amount of adrenaline or epinephrine, which causes vasodilation, and that leads to the circumrescue collapse. It's not 100% known what causes it. But if you remember this, the 110 one rule is that you have one minute to get your breathing under control, you've got 10 minutes of meaningful movement, and you've got about one hour before unconsciousness due to hypothermia. So let's move on to one other specific situation, and that's children. So their stages are actually very similar to the two adults. However, shivering is not as reliable, and it's much more important to follow their mental status. So if you have a child that's really irritable and really cranky, maybe it's because they're hungry and you didn't get them a hot chocolate that they were expecting, or maybe it's because they're getting really cold. So we need to follow that. And then remember that children have a greater surface area to mass ratio. So this is gonna influence their methods of heat transfer. There's more that's exposed. And oftentimes they'll have signs of life into their mid-teens. And I mean temperature here, not age. So they may still have a palpable pulse. They may still have signs of life with core temperatures down into their mid-teens. So we started with these questions early on. Must be freezing, below freezing to get hypothermia? No. You can die from hypothermia in minutes? No. Age doesn't matter. Well, in this case it does because the very young and the very old are more susceptible, but everybody can get it. I don't care how used to cold you are, you can still get hypothermic. And cotton is not the best fiber to wear. And no, you don't lose all your heat through your head. So I'm gonna go over the RSVP questions and then we'll bring up more questions that people might have. So did your answer change? Have you ever been hypothermic? Have you been cold stressed? Maybe you have been. So do St. Bernard dogs carry brandy? Nope. That was actually perpetuated by a painting that was done by Edward Lancier in 1820, who'd never been to the Alps. He made it up. But they were Alpine guard dogs. They were from St. Bernard Pass and they did rescue some wayward travelers. So, the hunter reaction or hunter reflex, now you know it's a sign of things getting a lot worse. And you're only dead when you're warm and dead. And no, sometimes you are just dead. Uh, that's if there's a fatal injury or ice in the airway. Compressions at the pulse is under 40. It's really hard to resist, but don't do it. Remember the metabolic demand is so low that there may actually be enough blood flow to the brain with a pulse of 40, 20, less, that it's actually appropriate for the temperature of that patient. And if we start compressions, we do have a greater risk of causing a terminal arrhythmia. Okay, now for final questions. All right. So Kai, I'm probably gonna butcher these words that you wrote, um, but question for transport. Foxtrot litter, the Norwegian, who Jervenduk, an insulated poncho which can buy zip, can be zipped to a sleeping bag, poncho, etc., and the heat vest and heat blanket, or chemical source of heat with a blizzard bag. 
is what I carry for transport of a hypothermic patient. What are your thoughts on that? I'm going hiking with you. <laughs> I was like, so, wow. <laughs> um, what I actually carry is the, what's called the HPMK, which is the, um, hypothermic prevention and management kit, which is used. It's, it's, uh, originally was developed by the military and it's now uh, marketed by several private agencies. But I mean, what it, the HPMK is lighter than what you have. Um, but it's something that I carry when I am, when I have to have everything on my back. When I'm not dependent upon materials that I'm carrying on my back, I have a doctor down, I have the heat packs, um, I have a uh, reflective uh, vapor barrier, and I carry a lot more. So it's really what you carry for hypothermia transport or treatment. It has to do with your capacity to haul it, whether you're hauling it on your back, whether you're sharing it amongst many people, or if you have some motorized transport, whether it's a snow machine or a helicopter. Right. Megan says, I read a recent article in the Wilderness and Environmental Journal, Journal of a case study of avalanche victim who, against medical advice, was up and moving after being submerged for over an hour. He then went into cardiac arrest and died. The article stated that keeping a patient horizontal will be standard practice. Is it now current standard practice? It is recommended practice that if you have um, rescued somebody from an avalanche, unburied them, and they are hypothermic, that you maintain them in a horizontal position. Unfortunately, we cannot restrain people necessarily to keep them from doing it. We do do what we can. Um, I've had a similar situation where we did an avalanche rescue and the person was so uh, disoriented. They were fighting us and they did stand up um, and they did then collapse. Um, this patient thankfully did not die. Um, the one that I'm referring to, but the recommended practice is that somebody that who is recovered from an avalanche, especially if you're looking at that much time, um, or is more than mildly hypothermic. So if they're moderate to severely hypothermic, that they are maintained in a horizontal position until they are warmed. All right. Any last minute questions for Jennifer? Just jot them down. I'll give it another minute or so. These are some great questions though, guys, I will say. <laughs> we got some resources here as well, guys, and I'll be sure to also um, link them um, in the, um, the email uh, afterwards so you guys can have uh, those uh, as well. So you don't have to like, oh no, I forgot it or I exit out or anything like that. Um, I'll, I'll list all of these as well. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Jennifer, um, as well as the Wilderness Medical Society, just for partnering with us on such a great event. Um, and I also want to thank all, everyone who joined us tonight. Um, I know that it's late in some places or earlier, wherever you are, but we appreciate you so much and greatly for joining us tonight. As I said, I'll be sending the recording and the slides out um, in the next couple of days. So be looking out for those. And if you guys need anything else or, you know, just want to reach out, um, I, I'm available by email and you guys can and I'll have your you'll have my email as well as um if you um want to um just send in any feedback or uh anything for events like these that's how we get better um a survey will be going out probably like five minutes after you guys end this event um so if you guys could just do me a favor and fill that out that would be great that's how we get better um and just happy holidays to everyone and i hope you guys stay safe out there um and just enjoy your night or morning <laughs> thank you guys and thank you jennifer again thank you everybody and thank you for the questions have a wonderful holiday. Stay warm or stay cool no matter where you are. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys.